uh, come on, shoplifters want a palm door. So, you know. That's very true. It's a film that's not named Roma. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this show, we like to democratize the film criticism conversation by bringing on fans and critics alike and having a different guest every episode select a film that uh, really resonated with them, whether it's a longtime favorite, something they grew up with, or a more recent film that, that uh, just really hit home. Uh, so this episode, we're going to be joined by Wen Lee, uh, film critic extraordinaire. So welcome to the show. Oh my goodness. I mean, the podcast just started, but already I want to cry. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. You're very kind. You're very kind, Robert. So uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about uh, who you are and what you're up to, what you're, what you're not up to, I guess, would be a shorter conversation. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> what, what your, uh, where they could find kind of your work and, and you know, what, your, what you have going on. Well, uh, my Twitter handle where I uh, post most of my stuff is uh, NLE318. And I'm also on Facebook as well. But apparently my name is pretty common among uh, the Vietnamese community. So I think you have to type in my name, Nguyen Li, along with King of the Seals, which is the nickname that my lovely cousin gave to me. I don't know why, but it just is. Yeah, I was That's... about to ask, what, what was the story behind that? Well, I think my cousin, well, back then I was chubbier. So I guess my cousin saw me and kind of like, you, you know what, you look like a sea lion. So I don't know, okay. they just call me that. But anyway, uh, yeah, so that's the case. And yeah, so if you uh, find me on Facebook as well, I also post my work up there. And recently I got a uh, day job at the Houston Chronicle newspaper down here in, obviously, Houston. And uh, I cover the northeast region of Houston. So that's Umbo, Kingwood, Atascacita. And, well, that took me a, a little bit away from kind of movie writing. But then it's still a lovely job. I get to know a little bit more about the community that I'm in. And uh, sometimes I do get one or two film stories to write about. Uh, for example, just a couple of days ago, I got to interview a U.S. raised but Vietnamese born director whose newest film, The Action of Fury, F U R I E, is showing in a few cities in the United States. And it's kind of a big deal to see a film from an individual in my community making waves beyond its country borders and, you know, get to be over here and to show to a lot of people. Yeah, I saw that. Congratulations on that piece. I know that that, that was something that was very uh, impactful for you to be able to write about. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for reading. Did yeah, you read course. it? I did read it. Okay. I did a great job. I'm, I'm just kidding. That was that was kind of like a pop quiz moment. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't put me on the spot. You're the guest here. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so uh, actually, you know what, I will maybe see if I can uh, link to that story, uh, or at least, you know, your your author page uh, in the uh, in the show notes for this episode. So if people want to, to read more about what you what you've been working on for the Houston Chronicle, um, they can they can find the link, uh, hopefully below if they're reading this on crookedtable.com. So, uh, so yeah, so so you and I, we have, I guess, been connected through online film critic society initially and kind of just Twitter and Facebook from there. Is that pretty much sound, that sound about right? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, asking uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, well, that's Facebook. Uh, according to <laughs> Facebook, it said that we've been friends since July 2018. And mm -hmm. I actually cannot remember our first encounter, but... I bet 99.95% that it has something to do with movies. Usually that's like the story of my life. When I reached out to you, or I don't remember if I reached out to I think you may have reached out to me initially. I think I, I put out a call for, for guests and you were like, hey, I'm, I'm willing to come on the show. I'm pretty sure that's how this uh, started. Did I? 
I guess I, I was, think so. I guess I was drunk. I think so. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> You're like sure, <laughs> sure, whatever. <laughs> I, I there's a, I have a lot of not extra time that I can devote to doing a <laughs> podcast. And so now we're here, and finally I get to hear your voice, and I get to realize that, hey, this Twitter account is actually ran by a person. Yeah, it's not a, a, not a bot, Russian or otherwise. Uh, it's just a, a human being with a, with a Facebook account. Well, I do have a, a list account. of uh, Turing <laughs> questions here that uh, I'll test out, but uh, we'll see. Oh, boy. So far you passed, but I don't know. <laughs> Yay, good news. Um, so when we talked about doing this, you mentioned a couple different films, mm -hmm. uh, which both were at the time Oscar nominees, yep. uh, and one of them walked away with a, a, one award. I know you really loved First Man. Yes. Uh, I guess since, since we, I opted not to talk about that, did you want to just quickly give, uh, give listeners your thoughts on First Man before we move into the, uh, the actual topic at hand? Are you sure you want to do that? It might take two hours. Sure, I mean, you might have oh to boy. you might have to split it up into uh, five parts. I'm <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do content. that. Well, uh, the thing is, I am uh, tremendously happy that First Man, I would say one of the ten best films, but personally, of the year 2018, did not come home empty-handed. I am so happy that you know that. That's the case right now. That's the world with, that we live in right now. That first man did win something. Obviously, it did not get as much attention as it deserved. But hey, I mean, for uh, I think this is the this is the film that we we will talk about more in the future. But unfortunately, most of the discussions will be like, why didn't we treat this film better? But at least we you know we get to still talk about it and. That's the point of uh, films, I guess. Something that we enjoy in the moment, and then afterward, we look back and you know we still talk about it. Yeah, I think I think with First Man, it's just I I don't know. It's a little I'm not sure exactly why it didn't do better at the box office. I, I um, especially when Damien Chazelle was on such a hot streak with um, with Whiplash and La La Land. But um, I, I do think I've and I've heard many other critics say that they they feel like that's probably one of the films from last year that's good that we're, that's going to endure uh, more than well <laughs> more than the film that ended up winning Best Picture. Um, <laughs> But we're not we're not going to besmirch the the podcast with that name of that. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, because I know you I know you kind of agree with with uh, a lot pretty much most of the film film critic community that 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 was far from the best choice uh, for best picture. <laughs> well, if if that is the if that is the case, I mean I'm not on the Academy voting board, but maybe one day. Hold on a second. Let me note it down on my to-do board. On and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The film did not get did not get as much as attention as it should have been because of all the uh, controversies and the talk around it. Some some of the controversies are admittedly and to be frank, idiotic. But mm -hmm. if that's Nobody likes to be dragged into controversies, you know, or areas where they're in a mud pit. So, obviously, if there's some distancing toward the film, then I can understand somewhat. I, I actually, I liked the film when I first saw it. I didn't love it like a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I definitely, I need to revisit it because I, I do feel like it's it's a much quieter and more somber movie than I think people initially expected from it, than I probably expected from it. So I feel like it's one that would benefit, I feel like First Man would really benefit from a, a second viewing on my part to to really appreciate it. Because I did like a lot of what it was going for and what it was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and and I and I you know, I'm a big fan of Whiplash and La La Land, so I like Chazelle as a director. So uh, so yeah, definitely need to revisit that uh, myself. So um, I guess we'll, this is a good point to to introduce the, this episode. The feature presentation we're going to talk about is Shoplifters. So let's listen to a little bit of the trailer right now. <laughs> それ<笑> 
映ってる。ああ。まずいな。これまずいよな。That was a little bit of the trailer for Shoplifters、uh, from.、Uh, I don't want to butcher the pronunciation. It's a Hirokazu, Koreeda. Yeah. This was obviously Japan's、uh, submission for best foreign language film and was nominated、uh, ultimately lost to Roma, which I mean, everybody basically knew was going to happen because Quoran has such an in with the Academy at this point. Anytime he does a movie, it's, it's、yep. pretty high up there.、Uh, What was,、uh, what was your thought process, or why, why did you want to talk about this movie? Why was this the one that,、uh, other than First Man, that was in contention? All right, so I guess this is the part where, you know, it's the kind of opening sentence of the opening statement where it might be too hot of a take, and then you may have to shut down your podcast or something like that. So I hope you're ready for this, Robert. But all right, all right.、I'm、I、ready. sincerely thought that Shoplifters. Is better than Roma. That is a hot take. Elaborate. Well, not because. Please understand that that was not a diss to Roma because they're telling, they're telling different stories, different settings, but ultimately both of them are really humanist. But then I feel like Shoplifters, it, it gets its、uh, humanism across more apparent and more impactful than Roma ever did because. At times, Roma did get too occupied in a way in its、uh, style. Shoplifters had none of that. Shoplifters,、uh, it just unfolds in a very unassuming way,、mm -hmm. but I would say that it's deceptively unassuming because a lot of the things that it does, it's really. It's quiet on the surface, but then underneath it, it has so much, so, so much things to say. And all of that r e s o n a t e with me. And I guess maybe because I'm,、uh, I'm a member of the,、uh, you know, I'm, I'm an Asian. You know, I can't hide, <laughs> I can't hide that. And also because、right. of the fact that、um, I do feel. A little bit of a connection to the Japanese culture as, as well because of、uh, my dad. He's, he, he's, an old, he, he's, what,、um, he's what people would call an overseas, an overseas Vietnamese because right after high school, he、uh, went to Japan and he,、um, he graduated there and he actually lived there for 17 years. And then he came back to Vietnam with some Japanese friends and associates as well. And then they do business in Vietnam and all that sort of good stuff. And so, you know,、mm. uh, my I'm Vietnamese, but the connection to Japan is, you know, it's always there. It's always there in my family because every time we have a gathering,、uh, my, um, my dad would get a friend and Now that mentioning his name made me realize that I haven't contacted him in a long time, and that's my bad.、Um, you know, but he would always be there at parties, at our gatherings, and he's such a happy person. And it's, you know, basically, basically it's just,、um, it's just a really beautiful thing, you know? And.、Mm -hmm. And, the,、um, and you know, the, the, the core of it, and the core of it, and it's,、uh, the core of it, it's just something that、uh, shoplifters manage to show. Sometimes, a lot of films, you have to go watch it in multiple times in order to dig deeper, in order to get to the core. But then for shoplifters, it does that in the first go. But then maybe, maybe you just don't realize it yet. And then, after for you know, like the, im the immediate rewatch, then you get to see its core right away. And 
again, I'm I'm sorry if I'm repeating this word too often, but it's you know it just is you know it's just right. It's just applicable for the film that it's it's beautiful. Yeah, I think um, in you know in your comparison with Roma, I do feel like Shoplifters. It it is. I mean, the word you used, an unassuming, is is, is perfectly suited to this film because um, it, it it does have the way that the, the way that it's shot and the way that it's constructed and the 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 way that there's you know there's kind of minimal score. It's very quiet. It feels very intimate. It does feel like you're you're living this life with these people. Um, and I you know I guess before we get too deep into this, the plot, I guess we should. <clears throat> do you mind? Do you want to tell listeners of this b- brief overview? What what is the film about? Like a, kind of like a two sentence uh, or a one paragraph, uh, just kind of summation of the premise. Well, just two sentence. Of course, you know, <laughs> briefish. I can do it. I can do it in one, and I have to go for it. And I have to thank IMDb for this. So yeah, there you go. Shoplifters. The original title is Manbiki Kazoku. is about a family of small time crooks taking a child that they find outside in the cold. And I thought that's a great summary because that's all you need to know. A little bit more, like just I guess just three more words, and then the magic is kind of bruised somewhat there's a lot going on in this film there's a lot happening with these people they all kind of have their own uh you know you really get a get a, a hint of their all of their their individual stories so you know you have subplots with with aki and with shota and with hatsu and like everybody has their own uh their own you know their own deal that we learn about throughout the course of the film and it's really just kind of all kicked off from uh, just the discovery of uh, of Yuri or Jury, I guess, as it, as it ends up being. Um, so, so I guess we kind of already delved into your, you know, why you picked the film. When did you first see it? Did you did you get a chance to see this in theaters anywhere, or was this just kind of one that you caught at a festival? Or what, what's the story there? Well, I guess during its a uh, theatrical run. Oh, and may, uh, may I say it's actually limited theatrical run. It didn't show mm-hmm. in Texas, so. I was a little bit saddened, but um, I guess it just, uh, it's just luck that I'm also a member of the Houston Film Critics Society and screener season arrived and I came home and there's a packet waiting in the front door and it's, uh, and it's everything nice. from Magnolia Pictures and apparently Magnolia Pictures is also the distributor of shoplifters and I just told myself that, okay, whatever is it, it is that I've already placed on the screeners to watch list, I'm just going to have to shift everything down and prioritize shoplifters. And I'm glad that I made that decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I meant to see it before, especially when the Oscar season, when it, when it got nominated. Um, and I, I had a screener from OFCS and it just expired before I got a chance to get to it. And then I was, you know, it was it was stuck between uh, theaters, even though it doesn't sound, sound like it got much of a theatrical release in the U.S. at all, um, and on demand, which it's now, I guess we should mention for people, it's available on demand. Uh, I actually rented it on Amazon. It's also on iTunes and everywhere. So uh, people that want to check it out. For four ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that too. It was three ninety nine like last week, and then it went up. I was like, well, all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to check it out. I've heard good things. <laughs> you know, my, my buddy Win Lee really likes it. So uh, <laughs> let's 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 invest the four ninety nine to shoplifters um so yeah so people want to check that out because we will be getting into spoilers shortly uh definitely highly recommended from both of us uh and it's funny that it made according to my my research made like three million in the u.s and canada so i don't even know where it made three million because i don't know where it played enough to make three million but it was huge over (laughs) overseas in japan obviously where it, it made there, it's one of the highest was one of the highest grossing movies of the year over there, and it's made a worldwide total over over seventy two million, which is pretty impressive, uh, considering uh, you know considering it's even for overseas. This is a very quiet like family, I guess in quotes family drama. Uh, you know, this isn't a big action movie or or anything like that. You wouldn't think would have that same kind of broad appeal. So it, it's really I think says something that. It managed to uh, really connect with audiences. Shoplifters actually reminds me of another really um, gentle, yeah, gentle is a great word, a gentle drama that my friend recommended me because she also 
uh, knows that I'm a big fan of Joe Hisaishi, the composer to um, the extraordinaire, and this and the usage of that word here is not sugarcoating in any way at all. But yeah, so Joe Hisaishi, he's the composer of a film called Departures in 2008, and she recommended that movie to me, and it was just. I think that might be the first time that I watch something from Japan that is not animated or directed by Hayao Miyazaki. And uh, mm -hmm. it also got a lot of attention as well and some great accolades as well. It's a... Uh, oh, yeah, of course. And one of the greatest accolades that it managed to garner is the Academy Award winner for Best Foreign Language Film. Yeah, there you go. so I really rooted for shoplifters to win foreign even though my better half within me it's saying that obviously roma is going to win just like you mentioned earlier but had you had you seen any films from i guess you hadn't really seen anything from Corrieta uh before this then actually my dad he showed me um like father like son an earlier right. film from him uh before but i couldn't remember anything about it so yeah, let's just I'll, I'll just treat this as my first uh, visit to uh, Korea's domain. Your first proper introduction, yeah. I guess. Yeah, let's just call it. Let's just call it a clean slate, so that you know we uh, we sway away any doubts. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I guess we can just get right into the review. So, like I said, spoilers. We're gonna discuss its open season on Shoplifters. Uh, so if you haven't seen the movie, go and check it out on on demand, iTunes, uh, Amazon, wherever you wherever you uh, get your movie fix from digitally. Uh, it's unfortunately it's not on like. Amazon Prime streaming or Netflix or anything like that. I imagine that will happen at some yeah. point soon. They should really fix that if they want to get more of an audience. I actually was on Twitter earlier today, and uh, David Chen, who's a, a film critic who I follow, who's on works for Slash mm -hmm. Filmcast and all that. He he was posting earlier today on Twitter that he was watching this, finally catching up with this movie, and I was like, "Hey, me too. <laughs> I'm talking about it later tonight." So I, I already feel like now that it's on demand, that people are starting to discover it uh, or finally get around to it. It's one of those that was such a small presence in the in the u.s that i think it slipped under a lot of even film critics radar which is probably probably part of why uh the the you know the oscar went to something like roma that's literally streaming on everybody's netflix account <laughs> yeah not to bring roma up again i think we'll probably try and make that the last time we bring up roma but it's you know it's the, this is the, one of the, this is probably the movie that was uh i would say this and cold war were probably close runner-ups to roma in that category but it sounds like uh, we're dissing <laughs> roma right now and that is again not the attention here yeah no that roma is an, is an excellent film it's just very very different and like you said i think it, it's i feel like it's style and the fact that it, it you know it, it, it Quaron's such a uh, visual storyteller that I feel like a lot of what's happening in that movie is the cinematography and like look at how we recreated this period and blah 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 and I feel like he gets so caught up in that that maybe the character stories kind of suffer a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, in that movie than they do here so uh, so going into shoplifters <laughs> leaving Roma back on Netflix where it belongs um, so this movie starts out and we follow Osamu uh, who's leaves, leaving his job and he twists his ankle. And then before you know it, he's hanging out with Shota. And then we're we really, I, I feel like it, it actually transitions. I think the first scene is actually uh, Osamu and Shota in the, in the store. That's actually the very beginning of the film. And, you know, introducing the, the concept of shoplifters in this world. Yeah, this is a heist film, don't you know? It kind of starts out as one, basically, and I, <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. The way that they, uh, the like, they're, you can tell that this is something that they do literally on a daily basis because uh, the way that the, they're they shifted, like he he blocked, he presented a, a distraction and blocked the the uh, you know the worker, the employee in the store's uh, view of Shota while he was like loading up his bag with all the products and stuff. And I thought that was and expert hand signals, all that sort. Of yeah, stuff. yeah. Like they, they, they know what they're doing, and they've been doing it really well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we get a little bit of an introduction to everybody's life. So Osamu is a, is a day laborer. Uh, Nobuyo is uh, working in like a laundry service. Aki works in, but it's basically. I mean, I am uh, Wikipedia or whatever, but calls it hostess club. So I guess it's basically like a, a peep show type of deal. 
and uh, sh- and Shota is is the, just a boy that lives. So it's basically you get like over the course of the film, you get the impression that I think you you it kind it slowly unravels that this is a family that is s- stitched together from from very uh, you know very unorthodox circumstances to say the least. So. <laughs> Uh, what, how do you, how do, what do you think about the, the chemistry with the family and the way that it's sort of revealed, like the truth about how all these people fit together? I guess, I mean, that really happens over the course of the movie. You don't really get the full answer until the end, but, uh, how did you feel about the way that information right. was doled out? And as we see everybody, um, kind of, I guess, feeling the, feeling the weight of, uh, the decisions that they've made and things like that. Well, Let's just say that the uh, the revelation in the film it hit me even harder than the morning coffee. Nice. So, we- because it it's just it's just incredible how you know everything just everything just goes along and even though like it's it's strange the situations are strange and sometimes the you know the the moral. Uh, the morality behind those decisions are also questionable as well, but then you just keep falling along and you thought that, hey, this family and, you know, the their members span three generations here. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, it's just they're human after all. And it's just funny to see them do that. It's just interesting to see them do that. But then once the truth hits you and then you find out that they are human, after all, even though all this weirdness going on, all the questionable morality, you know, you just have a totally different perspective on things. And I guess that's even more effective than, you know, any any plot twist, really. It's, um, it's a, you know, it's a spiritual twist as well. So, so this is absolutely like nothing else that I've seen in uh, 2018. And even the more brilliant thing about it is that of how it does that to me by being very gentle, by being very subtle, Mm -hmm. like, like it's talking to me over coffee and it's not shouting at me in Hollywood blockbuster uh, blockbuster style, yeah if you know yeah what I mean. absolutely it's it's very uh subdued and, it, and it's uh y- you know it really tells a very human story that um ultimately is very morally complex because what they're doing in the in, in this film to survive you know not only you know um, stealing but also kind of absorbing people into their group um which you know in 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 the case of uh, in the case of Yuri who as you mentioned is basically the inciting incident for the entire film um Mm-hmm. They they try to do what they feel like is the right thing. They try to bring her back, only to discover that her parents or her father it seems is very abusive and it's a very unhealthy uh, environment for her to be in. And that that right. you know she's essentially kind of trying to get away from them. Um, so you know the fact that they adopt her into their into their little family, I think, uh, is in a way as much of a kindness to her as it is you know, just as it is to the fact that they, you know, they, they, um, they could use another, they, they want to have another, they want to expand their, their family group. They want another person to care for. And they have, uh, all this emotional baggage that they're all dealing with. And really they're all, I, I think in the end, all the characters are, are trying to, they're all trying to, to find love and be loved. And, you know, you, I think you get that mostly, uh, a lot of ways from uh, Aki and the fact that she makes a connection with a regular customer of hers in the club where she works. Um, you know, it's, it's they're they're just looking right. in the the unlikeliest of places to find that sense of belonging that they didn't have with the people that they were the families they were born into. Mm-hmm. And this is a kind of film where, to me, you know, its greatness uh, grows in size the more that you look back at it and pick up the clues, like. When you, um, like, after the first go, and then you rewatch it, and then you try to pick up, when would be the first time that the film reveals to you that this is not a family by Mm -hmm. blood? Or you uh, find out the, you know, the uh, 
the actual uh, undercurrents of the of the images that you first see about the film, like the the two posters of the film, just depict that this family looks like any other family but then you know the truth and also suddenly that you suddenly you discover maybe that there's something in the dip, uh, deeper about the title of the film itself because when you tell somebody that they're a shoplifter what they're doing is that they're stealing something that they they don't have they're stealing something that they want maybe uh, usually property, usually food or you know just knickknacks. But for these people, what they're stealing, what they're trying to retrieve is actually a need. It's um, you know um, uh, chemistry, uh, love or something way more than that. But you know they have to steal it because it's something that they don't have originally right it's something that they feel like they can't get from from the world unless they seek it out uh kind of independently um and i i I think my first hint that something was going on with the the family dynamic is there's a scene outside i forget exactly what was happening before but uh shota and osamu are walking and osamu's trying to get him to like to call him dad and he He's like, oh no, you know, I don't want to, whatever that kind of thing. And I'm like, all right, so is he like, a, it's like a stepdad? Right. Like, what's the, what's the deal there? You know, I, I think that there's little, these little right. cracks in the, uh, in the, I guess, perfect picture as you mentioned with the poster, um, that that are really very strategically portioned out over the course of the oh, two hours that the movie runs. Um, also, when Hatsu goes to, mm-hmm. to uh, I guess her ex husband's family uh and you see the picture of uh, i think it's aki on the on the wall that realizing that oh okay those two right. are re- or or so, sort of related uh but you know they think that she's gone on vacation or something they think that she's abroad meanwhile she's just living down the street and hatsu's kind of hatsu's keeping her from her family uh, making you know under under false right. pretenses and going there for money uh that kind of thing like it, it you understand where they're coming from even even though at the same time like the movie reveals their uh, less than savory uh, antics i guess <laughs> for lack of a better term that didn't come into my head at that moment uh but their less than savory tactics how about that um but doesn't but ne- but doesn't condemn them it's from a place of compassion it's from a place of understanding uh that they're you know they're just trying to create a home uh because none of them really have one that meets their standards outside of them outside of each other yeah, exactly. It seems like, you know, at the core of it all, um, Hirokazu Koreeda, he's not, he's not making a comment on these people. He's just, you know, he's just showing them to you, and, but the main thing that he wants to impart on you all and you all being the viewers is just that they're human after all, and it's also really interesting to see you know a different a different facet of japan through this film because you know when you talk about japan generally the first thing that they think of is uh, a country where that's also a pantheon of advancement and uh you know technological um i don't have a word there so i'm just making a kind of like a nebula explosion <laughs> kind of sound because that's what basically Japan is, but then here, these people that are on screen, to, that are you know that you mm-hmm. are seeing right now, they shoplift for a yeah. living, <laughs> and they are also workaholic still. But then the kind of work that they do, that would fit the label unsavory, <laughs> and at the and kind of like maybe an implied undercurrent, I guess it's just. And this is also the inspiration behind the film as well, is the Japan is going through a recession right now. So maybe this is a better mirror to reflect the country for what it is rather than what we think it right. is. 
Yeah, you think Japan on film, and it's usually like the the heart of Tokyo and like all this opulence and things like that. And this the, this movie actually reminded me of something like the Florida Project, where um, it's just people living yeah. on the fringe of you know an, a, 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 a part of the world, whether it's you know a city or whatever, um, that people have a certain image of. You know, the Florida Project, right? They're living literally on the outskirts of. The, the happiest place on earth in Walt Disney World. And here it's like you have a vision of Tokyo that you bring, that you, you know, you carry with you just from, you know, pop culture and, you know, what you see in other movies and things like that. And this is just giving, showing you actually there's like, there's an entire underbelly of people that are just trying to get by, that are working on jobs, stealing when they need to, just kind of trying to survive. Uh, not everyone is living in that in that uh, you know that that bubble of that vision that you have of Tokyo or Disney World or whatever. Um, so that feels that felt to me like a, a good thematic companion piece because it does um, tread a lot of similar narrative ground, I guess. Right, and that's a beautiful comparison there, Robert. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, and. Um, and now I, I, what if the, I'm just curious because I was thinking this while I was watching the the film. What of the film? What of which character do you think has the most? Uh, I guess the most compelling story. I th- I think that um, I was really taken by Shota's, and I think he's he's one of the characters that has probably the most arc in the film. Does begin and I guess almost end with him. I think. Uh, is this? I don't remember. He's if he's in the very last scene, but I, I think uh, I think it's actually Yuri. It ends on Yuri, but it almost ends on Shota and Osamu's relationship. Um, so, is there a particular character or subplot that you uh, that you were, were particularly drawn to? I actually thought that you would uh, you were about to ask me the recipe for the for the croquette that they <laughs> ate with their ramen. But, okay, well, if you have that too, if, if you have that too, I'll question, take it. <laughs> no, they I looked good. I, when I tend to cook, I usually yeah. When I tend to cook, I usually check my uh, house insurance so that That's I don't burn the house good, down. But good, yeah. okay, well, if you want to go with a more difficult <laughs> question, bring it. <laughs> anyway, yes. So um, going back on topic, yes. Uh, that's a very difficult question, but to me, I guess the most compelling character has to be Nobuyo or the. Uh, the mm-hmm. lead actress, uh, you know, the uh, the female lead in the film, played by Sakura Ando, amazingly played by Sakura Ando, actually, because I I find it really compelling uh, stories about mothers, mm-hmm. you know, like um, and you know when we're speaking on that subject, I will always be reminded of. A thriller in the past called Madeo or Mother from Korea from uh, Bong Joon Ho, and you know it's just everything that everything that a mother goes through. It's something that really intrigues mm-hmm. me. You know, like all this all this strength that where where do you draw it from? And when when you draw that when you have that strength in you already and then you exert it it's just it's just greater than any force of nature really so here for the case of uh, Nobuyo she she doesn't you know she clearly she is trying to learn on uh, how to be a mother but she's not going about it as um how would you say it as um, as overt as uh, Osamu, right? You know, but um, but she's but she's in the background. She's very observant, and she she wants to she wants to be this motherly figure that maybe maybe and I don't know if it's even implied in the movie or not that in the past she has never experienced before. So here, when uh, Shota and Yuri. Uh, come into her life that's what she's trying to do and in one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the film and I swear the waterworks just 
keep on coming when that scene first came up and for subsequent rewatch <laughs> rewatch of the film as well is when uh, she finally the you know the family finally were uh, caught mm-hmm. by the police and she was uh, Nobuyo she was uh, interrogated and then I think the interrogator asked her um, that did the children ever think that you are their mother and and you know throughout the film we've seen that Nobuyo is a really you know it's a really distinct kind of person when you ask a yes or no question that's what she'll deliver either a yes or a no but now for this case she finally steps back and give an answer that lies in between where she just said to herself actually not even to the interrogator to herself that I wonder I wonder so she doesn't even she doesn't even know and she doesn't even know if they think it that way and you know on a deeper level I guess she doesn't even know if her all her the time with uh, Yuri and Shota all her time trying to be a mother in their eyes did it even, did it even work and it's just it's just the kind of questions that a mother also to me mothers also implicitly ask themselves too you know like am i am i a good enough mother am i still doing it right am i am i doing it right, right. as a parent you know and it's just uh well again this is another one of my personal stories it's just that uh Mom and I, we went through something, and we actually had that kind of a discussion before where she also asked me that question as well. And she told me that it is it is an implicit kind of question that all mothers ask, but then they just ask it within themselves. They, they would never ask mm-hmm. it out loud, you know? So, you know, it's just, it, it's, um, you know, it's... For so to answer your question, I would find maybe Nobuyo's story is the most compelling, and because this is a film where a lot of things unspoken are actually loudest in its communication to the viewers. So the I wonder scene, for example, it's really mm-hmm. quiet, but then yeah. it says a lot. Same deal with the scene. Uh, the holiday by the sea, where the um, where the oldest member of the family, Hatsue, played by the late uh, Kirin Kiki, she just look at them, look at everybody else in the family, jumping about the waves, and all she and all she did is she said, "Thank you," and I'm really glad that uh, the subtitles were there to help. Because otherwise, I would have missed it in the first go. Because she didn't say it out loud. She said it in a whisper. In a, I mean, I, I dare even say that even mm-hmm. lesser than a whisper. But then it's just a really simple sentence, a really simple expression. But then it says so, so much. Yeah, I think you make a, an excellent case for Nobuyo um, and and for Hatsue. Uh, I think that uh, especially the former, um, she has carries such quiet strength, and like you said, her the performance is so understated uh, that you know you, you really feel the weight of her trying to keep this family together to the to the to the point of self sacrifice that she ends up taking the the all the punishment at the end she ends up being the one sent to prison while Osamu is is roaming free and just you know kind of living trying to you know trying to reconnect with Shota up to you know at least early on um and um you know and as someone who has a mother and who's you know has a has a child i mean that's a, those are very those are conversations that you know my wife and i've had we, you know we we have our daughter is a little over 2 and we're all constantly asking ourselves you know are we doing the right thing you know uh, are we are we raising her right did we make are we making the right decision with x y or z uh, and i think mothers implicitly feel that much more because they're the one that they're bonding with the child before they even before they even give birth and the fact that Nobuya uh, who is established later in the film can't have children of her own therefore really kind of um, 
therefore really yes. you know making that desire even even more important to her to to be a mother figure to these children um i think that really really speaks to uh, it really speaks to kind of a universal experience that parents but especially mothers have mhm and i mean okay what are you going to what have you actually uh, shown to your daughter at first star wars or star trek <laughs> i mean the yeah, answer exactly. will the answer will determine whether you the answer will determine whether you're doing it right or not just saying that's that's yeah there you go that's these are the big questions mhm well we'll come back to it later maybe in a different <laughs> there you go or something like that I'm not going to put you on the spot now and I did it again so I <laughs> it's apologize. All good. So uh so we talked about uh uh about uh Nobuyo a little bit uh Osamu I, I I we mentioned and then Shota I feel like like I said I feel like his his character has the most development where he he his kind of doubt uh about this you know this family that starts early on with him being like no mm-hmm. I don't want to call you my dad you know I'm with you guys you're my family but eh, that's a bridge too far and then ultimately ends up letting himself you know mm-hmm. get caught on purpose just I think because he wants a way out um just because I think uh, what why do you think what do you think leads him to that decision is it just the fact that he he something doesn't feel right just an intuition or well I would uh I would say it's because of his age you know and uh to an extent uh Shota's placement in the world as well because he's the only person in this family that is um at a at a point in life where it's not you know where it's not i need to be led mm-hmm. by somebody but uh, and also at the same time he's not at an age where i'm fine being where i am right now so he's somewhere in the middle and you know being in that middle is always a recipe for uh, for internal chaos so he has all these questions in his head that um Yuri doesn't have that actually that nobody else in the family has because some uh because we have family members who are you know happy with where they are and we also have family members that I don't know where I am but these people they uh you know they 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 love me they care for me so I guess I should follow them he's somewhere in the middle and because uh kind of like kind of like a great ga- kind of like a character in the great gatsby you know he's within and mm-hmm. without at the same time so he gets to see everything he gets to see the whole picture and once you get to see the whole picture you have to ask yourself like is this the only picture that I'll get to see so obviously you'll be curious and you know and eventually you begin to find things that you know if you had not ask these questions then maybe you'll never find out and i guess it's shota is also the the you know the device that leads us to the revelation of the film too so uh there's that yeah I'll yeah absolutely um it's 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 interesting because it's it the family is is basically stitched together from the remnants of multiple families but in a weird way shota still still kind of has middle child syndrome a little bit when uh, when yuri is brought into the fold <laughs> you know what i mean right and not to mention that the um that yuri the the new child in uh, the family is also of a different right. gender as well so there's another interesting dynamic uh conflict even to to think about so i guess you know talking about yuri and and him having i guess a, a quote younger sister what what about uh aki and her her storyline working in the club and uh, i guess somehow sort of I, i don't know it's it's there's multiple interpretations of that i think of that scene where do you think mm-hmm. do you think that uh mr what is it mr four or whatever she calls him uh do you think he do you think that there is any inclination that he has like genuine feelings for her or do you think it's her just deluding herself into feeling like look someone understands me because uh, she's searching for that well i would say that uh, a point that i mentioned earlier about you know japan is not always this pantheon of mm-hmm. advancement um you know that point is uh, communicated uh, the strongest through uh, aki and uh Mr. Four or uh, Four Ban San and it's just um yeah I guess it's um 
it's just to show that uh, Japanese there's a not there's there's a different side to it as well. There's a side that's not always promoted, but it's because of but when we talk about Japan or when we talk about any other kind of culture or people after all this is also that what we have to consider in order to um, get the full picture and the fact that you know we have this hostess character and the line of work that she's in it's to give something that the uh, articles that you read about uh, Japanese you you would think that you know where where would they find time for pleasure you know when they when there are articles that says that they they would work themselves to death or they would work themselves to the point where you know there are a designated place to mm-hmm. take a nap at the office so where do you find time for these carnal pleasures it's just it's just that maybe the world sees uh, Japan for what they think it is this you know this place where um, technology uh, technological or advancement in any field actually where where the, the cradle of it all it it got to the point where it rendered the people as robots or think tanks rather than what they actually are mm-hmm. is human and again hu- human after all is the it's a big prominent message throughout shoplifters or any other Koreeda films from reviews or writings that uh, I've uh, read from friends as well. It's just, these are human, and that is them at their core. So take them as they take them as they are, accept their flaws, and they have they have things that they need that when you when you see it, it seems it seems bizarre. But when you step back and you really think about it, it's that, oh hey, they have the they have the same things that uh, that I do. They have the same genetic makeup as I do. It's just uh, labels or perspectives or pressures from other places that you know make them less right. so. Yeah, and I think um, you know we really really get into each of these characters and kind of their you know what they what they feel like they they need and like i think the common thread between all of them is that is they're they're all looking for belonging they're looking for validation um and then throughout the course of the movie i saw osamu and nobuyo uh are they kind of have their their sexual relationship reckon, like uh reawakens throughout the course of it which I, there's an even conversation early where osamu was like oh we're not connected we're connected in the heart not you know in our between our legs and uh and they they get their you know they get they kind of rekindle their their love um and i then i think a lot of that it speaks to the larger point of the film which is these these people that these people are all searching for that maybe osamu and nobuyo uh uh, they they have it with each other, but these these kids and I'm using kid loosely, obviously for Aki, who's looks like she's at least in her late teens, right? Uh, if not early twenties, um, they they this is not what they really chose. This is kind of a life that they fell into by various means. Um, so when that all comes to fall falling apart at the end, it's um, it, it's heartbreking in a way, but in a, in a, I guess for, for the children also kind of hopeful, like that maybe they'll find, they'll find that elsewhere. Uh, what was your sort of, what is your emotional reaction to, uh, to the, the fallout of, um, them getting caught and, you know, Shota, Shota goes into an, uh, an orphanage and, uh, Yuri, I guess goes, she goes actually back with her parents which is which is probably right. the the most upsetting uh, result <laughs> for her because um, clearly the abuse is not stopped in her absence and will probably only get worse uh, in going forward. So I feel like her her story ends up uh, ends on the the least hopeful note. Um, so what was your kind of reaction to the way that that everybody where they land t- towards the end of the film? Well, other than going through an entire box of Kleenex, yeah. it's um, it's just devastating to see them being put in what society would consider right. as the right place, but it's actually 
it puts them in a worse position. And because it, again, it, it, it also saddens me as well, Robert, because it, uh, how, how should I say it? These people, when you, the Shibatas, when you follow them through their journey, you, you can see them giving each other mm-hmm. what they lack, what they don't have. Or alternatively, what they you know what they ask for. Sometimes it's as simple as a croquette to eat with ramen, or you know sometimes it's more profound, like just caring for each other. Like don't abandon, like the the uh, the opposite of abandonment. Mm-hmm. That's what they give. But now when they're back in their right place, and that will be what they experience. It's you feel. You feel you feel like a part of you feels like okay this is where they should be right. you know back home in the right place in the right kind of care in the system in the correct system but it's not it didn't work mm-hmm. out for them in the beginning so oh, why why are they back to where they would find right less society happy? has forced them back in line and now they all are at least in the short term, going to suffer for it, I think is kind of the, the ultimate, um, and you know, the ultimate, I get, I guess thesis of the film is, yeah, you know, maybe they weren't doing the right things to survive, but they had each other. And now it's kind of every man and woman and child for themselves, I guess. Right. And that's a beautiful thing about, um, this film from Hirokazu Koreeda as well, which he which he also wrote mm-hmm. and edited, and I guess, and see see, Alfonso Cuarón, he's not the only person <laughs> that it can, can do it. Done. But yeah, it's just it it does end definitively. You know, like it ends on a um, it ends with actually not on it ends with a period, but when you take two steps back a little bit you real you realize that that dot is actually the underneath a really big question that will have you wonder and i would say films that can do that that's magic and that's basically what shoplifters is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, the last shot is Yuri looking over the balcony, just w- wondering, as you mentioned, what what the future is going to hold for her, and and uh, you know what happens, or what happens simply, next, or simply like, I'm just waiting to be taken away. Mm-hmm. I'm just waiting to be actually, and because she undergoes a, a name change in the film as well, right. which makes it, I think, appropriate for me to say this, she's waiting to be spirited away. Yeah, yeah, true. So, to a better place, to a place where, you know, she's actually loved, to a place where there's less chaos. Well, it's actually more chaos with the Shibatas because none of them are blood relatives, but hey, they love each other, they behave, they are even more familial than her actual family. So, there's that. Um, I think that that's that's I think we pretty much covered the film really well. Um, is there anything before we kind of start wrapping up? Is there anything about the movie that we haven't talked about that you wanted to make sure we covered? Why did Magnolia Pictures push this film? More? Yeah, well, there's that. I think it's it's encouraging that it's uh, like I said. I feel like it's, it's people people. It's only been on demand. I think about a week or two, and I feel like people are already starting to to discover it. And uh, hopefully, you know, it will endure based on that, and we can see more from uh, Corrieta in the near future, and maybe maybe even back at the Oscars. Who knows? Without a Quran film yeah. to <laughs> compete against. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I mean, come on, um, Asians work their butts off in 2018 with films ranging from brainless the meg to something absolutely profound like shoplifters and it didn't seem like uh, you know all the efforts were properly recognized or maybe or maybe they did but then you know certain controversies with uh, that has to do with the academy happened and you know just took the spotlight away from things that matter yeah yeah i mean well said um 
so definitely check out Shoplifters if you haven't seen it. Um, like I mentioned, it's available. Shoplift this film if you have to. <laughs> yeah, <if laughs> nice. You can. Nice. We don't we don't endorse any theft, but if you would do what you need to do to do to, we? <laughs> well, society doesn't. Have you had you see the movie? They're not cool with that. Um, <laughs> But yes, definitely check out Shoplifters uh, on demand in multiple different places or borrow a copy from a friend, whatever you need to do to see this, this film. It's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely very, um, very underrated, uh, and it has a very, a very specific voice that, it, that is worth checking out. So, uh, Wen Lee, thank you so much for coming on the Crooked Table podcast. Can you tell people once again where they can find you on social media? Well, again, uh, my Twitter handle is NLE318, and my Facebook is my name, but you may have to add King of the Seals at the end as well in order to find, you know, me, me. There you go. So, yeah, I I could always appreciate uh, more more friends and, you know, slash readers as well, because it's always nice to know that your the readers of your materials are more than you yourself and your shadow you know we need we need that validation that's why we feel like it's part of it's feel like it's an inherent part of being a writer it's like yeah we have things to say but we also want to know that people hear them so hit us up on twitter yes, and, and notice me <laughs> exactly pay attention to me uh, so winley thank you so much for being on the show uh this was a great conversation and hopefully we've uh we've turned some people on to checking out shoplifters so uh we'll definitely ha- have to have you back at some point uh just start thinking about what movies uh what movies you want to discuss and uh in the meantime i'll have to show my daughter both star wars and star trek so i can be like see we watched them simultaneously parallel screens right next to each other so ha in your face so now you're not just a good parent but then you're a great parent exactly well, that's so. the goal that's the goal. Shoplifters has inspired me to be a better parent. Well, but um, yeah, I would also like to say that you know, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me on. It's actually, um, you know, I I thought that I was really fortunate to be here. So, thank you to you know talking with another uh, lover of uh, appreciator of films. It's it, it's it's always great. Yeah, same here. Arigato. Arigato. If you're interested in joining me on the show to chat about one of your favorite films, head on over to crookedtable.com slash guest. Or you can consider supporting the show at patreon.com slash crookedtable. Of course, you can always find more podcasts, reviews, videos, and other movie-related goodies over at crookedtable.com. Until next time, this has been the Crooked Table Podcast, and I've been Rob. This has been a production of crookedtable.com. All rights reserved. F-Z-R-O-K-E-D. <laughs> <laughs>